Hello, and welcome to another session of Digital Slide Review and Sign Out. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel. Our program is part of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, uh, a joint venture of the Digital Pathology Association, which I might mention offers free membership to trainees and students, um, along with Path Presenter, which provides the foundation. So our, our case today comes from the realm of orthopedic pathology. Uh, it's a 40-year-old woman with a uh, lytic, uh, slightly sclerotic lesion of the tibia, uh, and she's had some recent onset of pain, difficulty climbing stairs, uh, no mass effect or anything of that sort, no known trauma, um, just those uh, symptoms of sort of a vague pain. So naturally, this leads to uh, <clears throat> first some plain film radiographs, and here you can see the PA and lateral views of this. I think we see it a little bit better here on the PA view, uh, where we can see there's a slightly scalloped and lucent area here with a little bit of peripheral uh, sclerosis um, and, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of variable modeling of the uh, uh, matrix here. Uh, it's fairly small. It's located in the uh, met metaphysis. It crosses the epiphysis here. Um, near her uh, growth plate. So in a 40-year-old woman, uh, this uh, lesion uh, merits some further evaluation, uh, but it's not clearly a neoplastic right off the, the, the bat. So uh, an MRI is done. Uh, here is the uh, uh, fat-weighted uh, images showing you the marrow fat, and uh, this lesion obviously uh, is not uh, uh, fatty-containing. Um, it shows you a dark area here and actually fairly extensive uh, here in the met metaphysis of her uh, proximal tibia. Uh, we do see a little bit of variable architecture uh, on this image. And then with the fluid weighted sequences, we can see that this lesion seems to preserve some measure of uh, bony trabeculae within the lesion um, and has a little bit more of this sort of permeative uh, pattern of infiltration. Uh, so a permeative lesion of this sort certainly does raise concern for uh, potentially other uh, processes, potentially neoplastic lesions. And so a uh, biopsy is obtained to guide further treatment. Um, this is a representative image from the biopsy showing a few preserved bony trabeculae. Um, and a very loose uh, mixoid appearing uh, matrix uh, with uh, scattered single cells, some binucleate cells, and so forth. Um, and so given this appearance, a diagnosis of uh, chondrosarcoma uh, was uh, rendered. Well, as we think about lesions in this location that can exhibit chondroid differentiation, of course, there are both benign and malignant lesions. There are low-grade and there are higher-grade lesions. So enchondroma, certainly at the very low end uh, of things. Uh, osteochondroma, not usually uh, pre presenting in this uh, pattern, but uh, would be associated with uh, benign appearing cartilage um, in some settings. Uh, low-grade chondrosarcomas, grade one and grade two lesions. And then chondroblastoma, chondromyxoid fibroma are both lesions that can occur in this location. Um, one more typically uh, uh, epiphyseal. Uh, and lastly, there are also the uh, chondroblastic osteosarcoma variants that uh, need to be excluded. So based on the diagnosis that uh, was rendered of a uh, grade two chondrosarcoma, plans for resection uh, were made uh, in an effort to uh, preserve function uh, over the long term. And since the lesion was small, a fairly localized uh, excision with uh, um, uh, close but uh, negative margins was obtained. After decalcification and fixation and so forth, this is a nice representative section. Uh, the lesion is confined still within the bone, but does extend to the uh, cortical areas. Uh, and we can see it does have this permeative pattern, uh, a little bit of destruction in some areas um, and some variability with some slightly pinker tissue areas uh, here and here, uh, as well as here, um, and then this uh, abundant mixoid tissue. 
So let's look first here at the uh, very uh, myxoid or chondroid areas. Uh, this is what was nicely represented on our biopsy, um, and it shows um, uh, fairly uh, low to intermediate cellularity for chondroid tissue, uh, a little bit of myxoid pattern to the uh, chondroid matrix, uh, and so forth. But one thing that was uh, present, but maybe not appreciated fully on the biopsy is uh, the presence of some appositional type new bone um, and some areas of uh, more cellularity. So we'll take a look at some of these. Uh, here's a suitable area here uh, where we see this pattern of bone formation uh, growing out from pre-existing um, uh, lamellar uh, bony spicules. Uh, as we look at this, we see there is some cartilaginous tissue associated with this, but we have other areas where it looks as though this is really laying down a uh, matrix, uh, an osteoid type of matrix that is then being calcified. Uh, and here we can see it, it containing these uh, atypical cells. Uh, we'll see a few more areas of a similar pattern. Um, here's another area right here. Uh, where again, we see this uh, matrix pattern of uh, more pinkish tissue uh, with uh, entrapped or uh, depositional uh, atypical cells. Uh, and here you can see these enlarged nuclei uh, within the uh, lacunae and so forth of the bony matrix. So uh, this is not a feature of conventional, uh, of conventional chondral sarcoma. The formation of bone in this setting is the consequence uh, of uh, osteogenic uh, differentiation within the tumor, which, uh, however, is predominantly chondroid. Uh, so this is a little bit of a pitfall to be aware of uh, in dealing with small samples from chondroid tumors. Uh, that unless it's been well sampled, we may miss the areas of uh, bony matrix deposition and hence, as uh, in this case, render a diagnosis of uh, chondrosarcoma initially rather than uh, the more uh, appropriate uh, osteosarcoma. Um, so this is not the highest grade of osteosarcoma, but it does uh, qualify as an osteosarcoma and uh, uh, having been treated in this manner uh, may warrant a more close uh, follow-up. Con chondroblastic osteosarcoma, of course, is one of just several morphologic subtypes uh, of uh, high-grade osteosarcoma. Um, and uh, although most uh, osteosarcomas have some mixture of chondroid osseous and fibrous matrix, um, the presence of any bone-forming matrix uh, with associated malignant cells qualifies the tumor to be termed an osteosarcoma. Um, in this particular circumstance, of course, origin near the growth plate of uh, long bones is the most frequent presentation. Um, and of course, this is a little bit misleading if, if uh, we don't identify that osseous matrix uh, on uh, biopsy. This patient is kind of in between the uh, typical age group for um, the more uh, typical pediatric <coughs> type osteosarcomas uh, <clears throat> and the uh, adult type osteosarcomas, which tend to have more fibrous matrix. Um, and so uh, it uh, may be a, a form of dedifferentiation from a pre-existing chondroid lesion, although we didn't really see evidence of a low-grade uh, chondroid uh, tumor in this uh, specimen. Um, <clears throat> Molecular-wise, uh, various mutations, various karyotypes are, uh, are, are present. Uh, some uh, cases, a minority, uh, have TP53 or MDM2 inactivation uh, or mutation, as well as uh, retinoblastoma gene in inactivation and other uh, molecular events. Uh, molecular testing is not necessarily uh, required for diagnosis, of course. So our final sign-out diagnosis in this case uh, on resection is a chondroblastic osteosarcoma of the tibia, uh, grade 2, uh, without uh, evidence of soft tissue extension. Well, thanks so much for joining us for this uh, episode in uh, 
uh, digital slide review. We hope that if you like that, you'll uh, share that with uh, colleagues and friends who may be uh, uh, interested in this topic. And of course, hit that button, subscribe, so you'll uh, catch uh, future um, releases of uh, additional uh, materials on our channel. We thank you for joining us and always welcome your feedback, either directly or as a comment. So until next time, thanks again for joining us.